I think it's a little of both. Um, of course, um, the FDA, because this week opioids are bad, you know, they're, they're running as fast as they can to keep up with the DEA and the, you know, the CDC with their ridiculous um, uh, guidelines to, to show that opioids are bad bad and we have to you know we have to do something about it so they came out with their uh, requirement that pharma uh, any drug company that had developed a drug a long-acting opioid drug was going to have to prove long-term safety and long-term efficacy and importantly to deal with the scourge of opioid induced hyperalgesia now opioid induced hyperalgesia has been proven in animals there's no doubt about it um, if you're a rat there is, it's just a straight line um, uh, response. But it's never been proven in man. And there's no real excuse for that. We have technologies uh, for measuring hyperalgesia and allodynia, which is a related phenomenon. Um, we've known about these things for years. There's protocols for, for using these outcomes and these technologies to measure hyperalgesia. But um, the problem is it's never been done. Now FDA has come out and said, well, we, we have to have these year-long studies to, to, to see what the, the nature of hyper, hyperalgesia is, and then of course the, what are you going to do about it? Uh, of course the problem is now everybody is rushing to try to understand the technology. They're rushing to try to put together these protocols to satisfy FDA, uh, and it's not happening because of unfamiliarity with these protocols, with these, with these outcomes. Um, uh, and because of the, the you know, there, there's requirements that it's got to be a year-long study, so you need to compare those taking opioids to those taking placebo. Anybody can see the problem with this. You're going to ask somebody to stay on placebo drug for a year for their pain complaint. So, of course, there's dropout, and at the end of the day, you don't have enough data to, to compare the two. Um, you know, it, all these things are surmountable, but, but everybody's playing catch-up to, to try to comply with the FDA rule. But, 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 you know, the FDA comes out with these rules every so years, like the REMS. You ever heard of that one? <laughs> of course you have. There was a, a period where you could not go to uh, a, a meeting like this without half the, the talks, at least containing reference to REMS, and probably a third of the talks would be about REMS, you know? And nothing came of it. REMS was a complete waste of time. It was just, it was just absolutely uh, an obsessional thing that, that everybody did and everybody talked about, and nothing came of it. There was no value to anybody, clinicians, patients, or pharma. Uh, it is my belief that, that FDA, you know, had to come out with something else now. And, and this opioid-induced hyperalgesia, amongst other things that they're requiring us to uh, obsess about, uh, is going to equally be a waste of time. And, and here's my data. We had taken uh, chronic low back pain patients where uh, half of them were on opioids, medium to high dose opioids, and we defined that. Uh, and we had our comparator group, which were patients with the same diagnosis, chronic low back pain, who were not on opioids. And we ran all of these tests, all these fancy and sometimes not fancy uh, tests for hyperalgesia and, uh, and allodynia in both groups. And what we expected to see were changes over time or changes if the opioid dose went up or if the opioid stopped. But we're always comparing it to patients who have the same diagnosis uh, and, um, and no opioid. Well, at the end of the day, in this small pilot study, there was absolutely no difference. Everybody had hyperalgesia. In other words, the patients that were on, uh, that were not taking opioids, they demonstrated hyperalgesia, as did the opioid patients, but there was no difference. The point being, this hyperalgesia phenomena, we've known about it for years. We call it central sensitization from pain. People who are in pain sort of supercharge their nervous system to make it more sensitive to pain. It's kind of like 
your brain is saying, this is important, pay attention to this. It, you know, I'm gonna make it more and more painful for you until you do something, you act in some way to relieve the pain or, or remove the cause of the pain. Um, that's being very uh, teleologic there, but, but the, the central sensitization phenomena occurs to equal degree in those that are taking opioids and those that are not. So this is the mythology. It's not the opioids that are causing hyperalgesia. It's the pain that's causing hyperalgesia. Or at least that is the hypothesis that devolves from this pilot work that I have done. Unfortunately, the money has run out and I will never go forward and definitively prove it one way or the other. But again, it's my hope that you know, some young researcher out there uh, who may be able to find some funding uh, uh, is listening and, and needs a career. Because this is good stuff. It's easily done, got the tests, know how to use them. Why haven't we done the research? Oh, and FDA wants it right now. Right now. You know, the sense of caution about these very potent and, and dangerous drugs. I mean, you have to take them very seriously. You know, the, uh, you know in, the, in, the, in the 90s, there was even the allegation that chronic pain patients never abuse, they never become dependent, they certainly never become addicted, um, and it's no fun for them because the pain kind of eats up the opioid and, and so it's no fun, so there's absolutely no risk. And I've heard doctors say that in the 90s, and that's wrong. Every drug, including aspirin, you know, can be lethal in the wrong context. And opioids are potent drugs. They're critical, it's, it's critically important that you realize that people can die, and it can ruin lives with addiction, okay? That's the value is to reset this exuberant zealotry of the 90s, but of course the reset has gone far out of the box. Uh, you know, it, cer it certainly makes, uh, makes life easier for family practice doctors who, because of guidelines like this, are finally gonna say, to hell with it. I'm not gonna prescribe opioids anymore. I'm just take my Schedule II license away. I don't want it. Too dang much trouble. And you listen to these guidelines and the discussion of how much you have to do to appropriately prescribe opioids. And you juxtapose that with the doctor that, you know, has got four minutes with an old patient and 14 minutes with a new patient. And you can imagine it's a, there, there's going to be a lot of this to, to hell with it. And I know pain management doctors that are saying to hell with it, it's too much trouble. I mean, 5,000 years of empirical experience using opioids for pain. There's something there. These drugs work, and they're very potent. We just have to realize that, you know, like everything else, there's a risk as well as a benefit. And you have to balance the two. You can't go overboard on the dang risk, you know, like the CDC uh, and that group are doing here. But you can't go overboard, like on the benefit side, ignoring risk. It, that's the point, you know. It's like it, it, have, having the pendulum swing, you know, to crazy extremes uh, is doing nobody any good. We need to we need to catch it when it comes to the middle, to you know, balanced, moderate, thoughtful approach with with none of this foaming at the mouth on either end of the thing.